Luke chapter 15. We're not going to read the whole passage, okay? So that's all right. But we are going to read verses 1 through 3 because we really need to hit the context here with this passage. And why am I preaching on Luke 15? Luke 15, verse 1. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he, that's Jesus, told them this parable. You all may be seated. Over the past couple weeks, like once I knew that this Sunday was going to be my last Sunday, I was sitting there thinking, okay, hey, what do I preach on? And I asked Jay, our new senior pastor, and also Aaron Bryant, who's my supervisor. I said, guys, I know we're in this sermon series on disciples multiplying disciples, but can I deviate from that? And they're like, sure. And I was going to put Scott Harris, my first supervisor, on the spot because there's a joke one time, and it might be true, that he preached at the, camp, at the Brentwood campus, and we read the text for the day, and he said, this is a great text. But there's another text I want to preach on today, and we preached out of another text. So I was going to do that today, but this passage is so long, I was like, no, I won't do that. So Scott, thanks for being such a great example. So anyway, I love Scott. He's a dear friend of mine, and thank you for hiring me, for putting me here through the Holy Spirit here at the church at Woodbine. But I got a question. Here in this passage, Jesus shares three parables, lost sheep, lost coin, and lost son. And my question for you is this, have you ever lost anything in your life? Important, maybe not important, anything like that. I use readers. And several weeks ago, I was walking around the house, where are my glasses? I cannot find my glasses. And I wandered and I was too embarrassed to like ask Christy for help, but I couldn't find my glasses. And they literally were like this. I wear a baseball hat a lot of times, but I wander the house looking for my glasses, and I realized, oh, I'm not going to tell a soul. Just a couple days ago, and I think just because everything going on in my mind, I was trying to find my keys. And I literally was walking around the house. Where are my keys? I cannot find my keys. And I was walking around. I looked under where the key was. I was on my kitchen table. I went back to the bedroom, and I was like, oh. I'm definitely not telling anybody about that. And I had it on my hand. I was holding my keys. Okay, I'm really humbling myself. Have you ever done that? Now, if you haven't, you're just not old enough, okay? (laughs) It will happen. We all lose stuff. Sometimes it's just our glasses, it's our keys. Sometimes we get lost in traffic. If you guys want to see me lose my salvation and have to go to confession... Watch me in the car when when I get lost. I hate being lost. And my family's laughing. Growing up, I'd pour over maps, the Atlas, the Rand McNally maps on our big long trips up to Ohio and just study cities. And I don't know if that gave me a good just kind of awareness of how to find things. But I rarely get lost. And when I get lost, I can get really mad and really upset. If I lose my wallet... I'll turn the house up, upside down, and I literally can't function until I find it. When you lose things, what's your response? How do you react? Here we have Jesus. And now Jesus, in this context of Luke chapter 15, he already has his 12 disciples. He's been traveling all throughout Israel, especially Galilee. He's preaching, he's teaching, he's healing people. There's signs, there's wonders, there's miracles. Thousands of people are following Jesus. He's got enemies now. And they start to criticize him. Why? Because right here in this passage, it says in verse 1, all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. As I was praying about this last sermon that I was going to preach here as your campus pastor here at Woodbine, the Lord kept impressing upon my heart the Father heart of God. The very first sermon I preached here was on this passage. And I thought, hey, I love burgers. I love to eat. We'll just sandwich it. Both the top bun, the bottom bun will be on Luke chapter 15. The Father heart of God. If there's any message that I want to leave with you, I leave it from this passage. God's heart, his desire, is to reconcile the world to himself. 
every man, every woman, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. And as we sang earlier, we have a good, good father and his love and his faithfulness pursues us. So right here in this passage, we see that all the tax collectors, and if you don't know the context of first century Palestine, the tax collectors were Jewish men who worked for Rome. They were considered betrayers and traitors of the Jewish people. Most tax collectors would extortion and steal from the people of Israel with their taxes. They would have Roman soldiers with with them to enforce and impose their will. And many times, most tax collectors would charge way more than what they were supposed to in taxes. And so the tax collectors were hated by the Jewish people. They had betrayed their own people, they had betrayed their nation, and they were stealing from their own people. And so there were even laws that would not allow the tax collectors to even enter into the temple and into the synagogues. They were hated and despised, especially by the scribes and Pharisees. And yet here Jesus is, He's, they're drawing near, the tax collectors are drawing near to Jesus to listen to him. And if you read the Gospels, all throughout the Gospels, you'll see Jesus eating with tax collectors, going to their house. One of the 12 disciples, Matthew, also known as Levi, was a tax collector. And Jesus called him, follow me. We can easily translate it into our day and age now. What is the people group or people that are most despised by the church? Don't answer, okay? But think about it. Who are the people that are most despised by the church? Those were the tax collectors in the first century. And yet Jesus not only welcomes them, one of them is one of their disciples. And he eats with them. And in that culture, in that time, eating with somebody was embracing that person as a friend, as someone who was kind of part of the family. And for the religious people, for the Pharisees, (gasps) how could he do that? Because just like then and many times today, a lot of Christians believe that the bad, sinful people might infect us. And so we got to stay away because they might contaminate us. Now, Scripture does say bad company corrupts good character. But you see, the light and love and power of Jesus, when the lepers touched Jesus, he wasn't infected. They were healed. When the woman who was bleeding for 12 years, when she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, he didn't become unclean, which according to their traditions, he should have. He healed her in every way. Because the power and love and light of Jesus flowed out of him. And for some reason, the tax collectors, the most despised and rejected of all the peoples in first century Israel... They were drawn to Jesus. And then it says here, the sinners as well. The sinners were drawn to Jesus. Why? What was it about Jesus that drew the sinners in? Those who were despised and rejected by the religious people, they were drawn in by who Jesus was. Now we know he didn't condone their sin. He didn't condone their lifestyles or their actions. All throughout Jesus' ministry, we see him time and time again where he'd say, you see, your faith has healed you. Now go and sin no more. He goes directly to Zacchaeus, who is the chief of tax collectors, and he tells him, Zacchaeus, I must stay in your house today. And by the end of that day, Zacchaeus repents. Too many times a lot of people think that Jesus is kind of like Santa Claus, this lovey-dovey type of love where, hey, I just want you to be happy and whatever you want to do, you do it. Uh Uh-uh. Jesus, he calls us, if we want to be his disciple, to lay down our lives, pick up his cross, and follow him. In order to have life, we must die. In order to be first, we must be last. In order to win, we must lose. And that is completely surrendering ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he wants his way, his time. 
And yet these sinners, these tax collectors, were drawn to him. Why? I don't know if my brothers would remember this or not, but when we were growing up, my parents bought this bug light. And it's this bright light, fluorescent light we had outside at like our patio area, and then it had the, like this electrical cage around it. And at night, the light would shine, and the bugs would be drawn to it, and they'd hit that electrical cage and just burn up. It was nasty. And sometimes we'd put like those big, huge caterpillars on them. It stunk nasty. In the same way that bugs are drawn to Jesus, that light, the light, sorry, we're the bugs and we're drawn to Jesus. Okay, that's the correlation. <laughs> but in the same way that bugs are drawn to light at night, these tax collectors and sinners were drawn to Jesus. And yet the religious leaders were criticizing him, were complaining that he eats with sinners and that he receives sinners. So Jesus, he shares three parables. The first one is the lost sheep. The second one is the lost coin. And then the third one is the lost son. I would change the name of that third parable to the love of the father. Because it's not only about the second son, it's about the first son. But more than anything else, it's about the love of the father. All right, let's stand again. We're going to eat here in a minute, so let's burn these calories off. Verse 11, and if you can't stand, I totally get it. Verse 11, he also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of my estate, of the state that's coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he longed to eat his fill from the, pods of the, from the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one would give him anything. You all may be seated. Here we have in this third parable, and there's actually three sections. There's the section about the second son, the section about the father and the son, and then there's the third section about the older son and the father. But we have a father, and he's got two sons. And we know that this father is extremely wealthy. He's very wealthy and with these two sons. And you guys know the story. We just read it. The younger son comes to his father. And every time I read this passage, I'm trying to figure out, okay, what type of tone did that younger son have when he asked and basically demanded his inheritance? Father, if you could, you know, I don't know if you, but could I kind of get what's coming to me, please? Or did he come in demanding, Father, I want what I deserve. I mean, you could read it so many different ways. Now, back in that time, and even according to Old Testament law, it was, un it was unusual, but it was possible that the father could distribute the state to his children before he dies. But for a son to come and ask that of his father while the father is still alive is a horrific disgrace. For most of us, we come from North America, and we don't understand the honor and shame within cultures that are honor-shame cultures. We're honoring or shaming someone. And so what this younger son is doing, he's basically spitting in his father's eye, giving him the finger, telling him, I wish you were dead, but I won't kill you, but I want what is mine. Give it to me. The father could have had his son stoned if he pressed hard enough on Old Testament law for the disrespect that this son cast upon not only the father, but the whole family and even the town. What does the father do? He distributes the estate. Now, this is the younger son. And according to Old Testament law, the oldest would get two-thirds. And my older brother is here, and he's the oldest, so he would get two-thirds of the estate. And then everyone else gets what's divided out. I'm glad that's not true anymore, okay? Okay. So the son gets one-third of the estate. It says a few days later, he took everything he had and he went to a far-off country where he wasted it all in wild living. Now think about it. His father didn't give him a new bank account with a debit credit card to go. It would have been land and cattle. 
Now, he can't take the land and cattle with him. So this younger son sells it all so he can t- carry it all with his, in his person. And if he sells it quickly, he's going to get the lowest, quickest bid. So he's already wasting his inheritance. He goes to a far off country. He doesn't want to have anything to do with his dad. He doesn't want to have anything to do with his community. He wants to live how he wants to live, the way he wants to live it for as long as he can. Wild living. We don't know what that means, but the older son later on accuses him of wasting everything with prostitutes. We can imagine. And while he had money, he had friends. He wasted it all, and then after he wasted it all, what comes next? A severe famine. And it says he joins himself. The Greek is like clinging himself to a citizen of that country who sends him out to feed pigs. Again, there's so much culturally here that if we don't understand it and get it, we miss so much of the power of this message. Pigs were considered unclean animals for the Jew in the Old Testament. Yes, this is the New Testament here, but it's still the Old Covenant. And so to eat anything, pork, bacon, ham, bacon, pork, more bacon. We couldn't do it if we were still living in the Old Testament. Thank you, Jesus, for changing that. You put anything, you wrap bacon around anything, it's good. Water chestnuts by themselves, oof. Put some bacon around it, oh man, it's candy. So for Jesus, for these tax collectors and sinners, for these Pharisees and these scribes who are criticizing Jesus, look at where this young man is, this younger son, wallowing and wasting away in the pigsty. He had it all. He was living and serving under his father's care. And yet this young man in his own selfishness, sinfulness, pride, arrogance, sexual immorality, greed, idolatry, just on and on and on. But that ruthless self-centeredness, egotistical, arrogant young son, he follows that and he turns himself over to a deprived mind, a, um, a deceived heart. And he finds himself broken, homeless, penniless, no friends, no family, longing to eat pig food. Living in Mexico every day, people in our neighborhood would go around with five-gallon buckets collecting wasted food, leftover food from people's homes to feed the pigs they would have. Those buckets were nasty. Well, not the bucket, but what was inside the bucket. And every time I read this passage, Noel's laughing because he's, he's seen it before. This kid was so hungry, he longed to eat pig food. Pig food. Very good. And then this is the amazing thing. Here in verse... 17, this is the turning point. It says, when he came to his senses. When he came to his senses. You see, Scripture says, and we won't look at the Scriptures, but in Romans chapter 1. In Romans 1, and you can look this up. It's verse 21 through 24, 26 and 28. Paul is giving this huge list of just all the characteristics of the sinful nature. Anger, pride, arrogance, sexual immorality, selfishness, idolatry, just on and on and on and on and on. And it says when people actively pursue sin, it says that God actually will deliver them over to a depraved mind. He will deliver them over to a corrupted heart. If we persist in sin long enough, we will become completely blind to the realities and what is true and right and good. And God literally turns us over 
to our own destruction. And by God's incredible grace here in this parable, it says this young man came to his senses. That is only by the work of Holy Spirit. He came to his senses and he's like, what am I doing? I'm dying here and there are servants in my father's house who have food to spare. I know what I'll do. I will go back to my father. I'll confess to him. Father, I have sinned against you and heaven. So I've sinned against God too. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just let me be a servant. That's enough. Just let me be a servant. For the, his, this young man, for his whole life, he lived for what he got from his father in total self-centered arrogance. And he literally came to his end. And by the power and work of Holy Spirit, came to his senses and realized true repentance is when we, it's a changing of the mind, but it's laying everything at Jesus' feet. No contracts. Jesus, I'll do this, but we kind of mentally have, but you better follow through. It's laying everything at Jesus' feet. Acknowledging we're not worthy of anything. Nothing. This young son was a son, and yet he finally realized, I'm not even worthy to be my father's son. That is true humility. It's true repentance, recognize that, Lord, I, I just want to be a servant. Just, I want to be in your presence. I'm willing to do whatever, but I want to be with you. So he gets up and he heads back home. Now he's running the risk of several things. Not only did he disgrace his father and family, but that whole town. So by the time he gets back home, the town people could have beaten him up, could have rejected him, not even letting, letting him get to his home. And yet it says right here, as he heads back here in verse 17, no, sorry, in verse 20, so he got up, went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion and ran to the son. There's several things here. That father saw the son from a long way off. So that tells me for months, years, that father was constantly looking, is my son coming home? Constantly looking, is my son coming home? We can't make anyone love us. That father knew he couldn't force or make his younger son be and stay with him. But he loved his son, but he couldn't make his son love him. And when he saw his son stumbling back in tattered clothes, we don't know. It says he was filled with compassion and he ran to that son. In Jesus' day during that time, old men would not run. It was a disgrace. And wearing the tunics they would wear, the clothes they'd wear in order to run, you got to lift it all up. And that culture, older men would not show their legs, hairy or not. But for that older man to run to his son, he would have to lift up his clothes and run. An extremely disgraceful action. But him running to that son, embracing that son, kissing that son, that father is communicating to his older son, to his whole family, to the whole community, all the disgrace, all the sin, all the actions that my younger son has committed and has done so against me, I put upon myself, and he's forgiven. He embraces that son. He kisses that son. And then the son confesses, Father, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven, and I'm no longer worthy to be your son. That's it. The father interrupts him and says, Quick, bring a tunic, a new robe, bring a ring, bring sandals. A robe, new life. The ring of authority, you are still my son. You have all of my authority and I give you the signet ring again because you are my son and you have all authority in this household. Sandals, 
You are my son because servants went barefoot, sons had sandals. Take the fatted calf, slaughter it. We are going to celebrate. For this son of mine was lost. He's now alive. He was dead. He was lost. He's now found. He was dead. He's now alive. And so they begin to celebrate. Complete, total reconciliation. It's the father's grace and love upon this son who did not deserve it. The third point later on that day. The older son is coming back and he hears the music. I've always wondered, it says he hears the dancing. How do you hear dancing? Was it a rave? Was it a techno? I'm... And he asks the servant, what's going on? And they tell him, your little brother's back. And it says he became angry and refused to go in. So it says the father has to come out and pleads with his older son to come in. And if you look at this, how does this older son react? And see, applying this, the younger son in this par parable are the tax collectors and sinners. The father in this parable is the Lord Jesus. The older son in this parable are the Pharisees and scribes. And look at how this older son, look at what happens. Says he became angry and he replied to his father. This is verse 29. Look, this, or he says, I've been slaving many years for you. The older son, that's how he felt. He didn't feel like a son. He felt like a slave to his own father. I've been slaving for you. And you never have given me a goat. I never disobeyed you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Never. I never disobeyed you and you've never given me a goat. Can y'all see the rage and the anger and the self-righteousness? And yet this son of yours, not my little brother, this son of yours comes back. After squandering the state with prostitutes, and you kill the fatted calf. That is that self-righteous, arrogant, many times religious person that feels like a slave to Jesus instead of a son or daughter of the Father. Most of what this older son said was right. The son squandered his estate. We don't know how, but he squandered it. The father did kill the fatted calf. They did celebrate. But this older son is accusing his father of being gracious and merciful. And then verse 31, the father tells this older son, son, the Greek there is actually means child. My little child. You are always with me and everything I have is yours. The father's heart, even for the older son, who is so arrogant, self-righteous. You've always been with me and everything I have has always been yours. But see, the self-righteous arrogance of this older son couldn't see it. He couldn't experience the love that his father had for him, understanding that Everything that the father had was his too. All he saw was his younger brother not only taking one third of the inheritance, but now that he's back alive, he's going to take another third of it. And he can't celebrate the fact that his younger brother is alive and well. But the father says here, but we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. I want to ask the worship team to come forward. And I know I went late. It's okay. There are three people in this parable. The younger son, who represents tax collectors and sinners. The older son, who represents the Pharisees and scribes. And then the father, who represents Jesus, represents the father. Which one are you? Most of 
I know a lot of you. But I don't know everyone here. And there could be some of us here who truly have not repented of our sins and we're languishing and we might not even know it and the pigsty of sin and selfishness and pride and greed and arrogance and immorality and everything else. And Jesus longs for you to come home. There are some of us that are more like the older son, constantly criticizing not only God, but everyone else. And we haven't experienced the incredible love of the Father, knowing that he loves us, not with the Santa Claus, ooey-gooey love, but with a love that's so amazingly extravagant that he gave his own life for our salvation. And our Heavenly Father longs to pour his grace into our hearts each and every day. We have a Father who loves us far above and beyond anything we could ask or imagine. And yet Jesus abiding in us, his love is deep, it's long, it's high, it's wide. And by coming humbly to him and humble repentance and abiding in Christ every day, we can experience the love of that Father and then give it away to those around us. What drew the tax collectors and sinners to Jesus? It was himself. It was his very person, his character, his love, his mercy, his power, his grace. Many were drawn to Jesus to get something from Jesus. And Jesus still gave himself away, still gave his love away, still forgave, still taught, still healed, because that is who he is. And he longs to have a real, deep, intimate relationship with every single one of us today. Jesus loves you. He gave his life to you. Our Father loves you. And my prayer for you, for me, is that Christ would abide in our hearts through faith, that we would be able to comprehend with all the saints how wide and long and high and deep the love of God is for us. And that we would truly understand that God is so powerful that he can do far above and respond far above anything we could ask or imagine. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to close with this song. My desire is that our eyes are fixed on Jesus and that we would experience that love. I'm a little out of it today. I think we'll have some friends over here at Next Steps. So if you need prayer, we would love to pray with you as we worship. So let's worship him.